authentic conversations with wedding professionals as they share their stories, insights, and tips from inside the wedding industry. We'll chat about how to be authentic and that it's okay not to be perfect or run your business like someone else's Instagram. Let's dive into the privilege it is to serve our clients and discover the talented creatives that make up our community. When we share what we know and who we are, we better serve our couples as a wedding day team, as well as each other. Simply put, be Fabo. Now here's your host, Bobby Brinkman. Hey, BFABO Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us. This is a bonus episode this week. A couple of days ago, we released David Skaggs, owner of Coterie Creative. He's a wonderful filmmaker out of St. Louis, so his episode went live, and uh, we knew during the taping and interview process that we were not going to be able to get to some of the questions that um, some FABO listeners sent in. So we had about 20 questions come in. I chose... Uh, 10 questions and I asked David if he would stick around um, and share his insights and information experience with us on these 10 questions. David did not know the 10 questions that I was going to toss at him. So here are his responses. They're candid conversations. Um, Hopefully they share some insight to those in the industry that ask a question that will help encourage you and uh, have you pursue your passion behind the lens as well as a couple from engaged couples that will hopefully help direct you into asking the questions for your filmmaker and videographer because um, I think you'll hear through the interview that David's uh, importance of having a uh, cinematographer capture your day. And uh, as a reminder, down in show notes, it, uh, it's how to reach out to David. Um, he would love to tell your story no matter where you're uh, saying I do at. He is available for Destination Weddings. So uh, he's be privileged and honored to uh, capture that for you. So reach out to David with any more questions or um, if you would like to hire him to capture your day. He's all about it. So without further ado, here are 10 questions with David Skaggs, the filmmaker and owner of Coterie Creative. All right, listeners, we are back with a bonus episode uh, to ask the masterful David Skaggs. Uh, So many of you sent some questions in, and uh, so we're going to do some rapid-fire questions here with David. You know, so I appreciate you listening in, but um, you all wanted to get some questions answered from this talented cinematographer. So uh, thank you guys for sending them in, and and thanks for also telling me where you're from. Um, That kind of helps David and I kind of just see who's listening. And, And again, David's available for Destination Wedding, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'm sure he would love to capture your love story wherever it's being told. So, all right, David. So first up from Susan is a very good question. It's how do you feel about starting a cinematography business? How do you feel the best way to do so? Should I shadow and how long should I shadow or should I just take the first steps and go for it? Um, Yeah. I mean, I guess like for me, it was a slow burn. I mean, you know, it's been almost a decade long process for me to start my own, but my suggestion first thing is first is to invest in a good camera. That's, that's the first thing you invest in a good body. You can rent lenses from pretty much anywhere. So you definitely need to invest in a good camera body and camera system, something with a full frame sensor at least. And then, yeah, I mean, reach out to some people, see if there's a, a, a local film group in your area and just kind of say like, look, I want to learn somebody somebody take me under their wing and there's going to be people that do that because I mean, that's, that's something that I do for local cinematographers here. Like I've, I just had a meeting last week with somebody who asked me like, Hey, I've seen your work. I met him in Colorado randomly. And we both discovered that we were in, that we lived in St. Louis. So we had lunch just last week. And he was just like, you know, I'd love to come and shadow you. I won't, can you, can you put me on some shoots as a third shooter? You don't have to pay me, which is an amazing thing for a business owner to hear. And, um, you know, can I come and learn? So that would be, yeah, I absolutely shadow, reach out to some people, throw some, throw some stuff out through Instagram, you know, follow, follow people. Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery is what I say. So like go out there, learn from people, watch films, reach out to people and just, and just put yourself out there and don't be afraid to not get an answer back. You know, some people might get busy and they just might not answer back, but at least if you're going out there, you're showing that you want to learn and you're showing that you are interested and invested in yourself. So that's, that's the first thing to do is like really hone your skills, understand the creative side of it, because everybody can learn how to, how to, how to start and run a business. You could take classes on that. You could do whatever you need to do, 
but you need to really understand the creative side of it first. So get good at that, feel good about your work and just constantly understand that you're always going to be getting better, that there's always somebody who's going to be better than you and you can learn from. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And Susan, don't be afraid to ask the question. Dave and I talk about all the time. You know, we're the kind of people that just ask. You can't even get a no if you don't ask the question. So if you find somebody and it's so much easier now to just DM somebody and say, hey, I really admire your work, you know, but also don't be a jerk and say, hey, I'd love to come along and follow you and do something because some of us don't want to train our, our per se competition. It's hard to, it's hard to train on an actual wedding. Exactly. You know? Because Especially our clients, exactly. Our clients paid for us to be there, not so much having somebody come along. But I also think if you come along, you're going to learn the logistics of a wedding and so Susan, if you don't go to a lot of weddings and a lot of you guys don't attend weddings, you don't even know how it goes. So sometimes right. just say, Hey, I don't want to bring a camera. I just like to follow on and learn and maybe lug a bag around. You'll learn from the inside. We all, out. We all need somebody to make Instagram stories. Exactly. So. We all need to do that. So that's a very good point. All right. Mark from South Carolina says, I love shooting. We probably need to, you know, correct. You know, that's, do we need to change oh, I got, our industry? Oh I, got, oh, I got in trouble actually when yeah. I was in college when I worked for the TV station because President Clinton came yeah. to the University of Central Missouri and I was supposed to film one of his speeches. So I was like, yeah, I got to go shoot President Clinton now. And yep. people were a little upset. I, well, like, I, I, I remember I got pulled over one time in downtown St. Louis for a taillight being out. And the officer said, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I was just off shooting up on, I was just on a Western Avenue shooting. And immediately <laughs> he put on his gun. I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm a photographer, I'm a photographer. Right. The look <laughs> on his face was like, I'm out here, you know, but I mean, and now, yeah. now I think politically correct, we need to change the word shooting. But Mark's question is, I love shooting, but I don't like the editing process. What's your take on outsourcing? And do you think it loses, if you outsource, do you think it loses the integrity of your film? Um, no, I actually don't. I, I, yeah, it's a really good question. So I do a lot of my own editing because I love editing. I do know editors that sometimes I will outsource projects to. Um, there wouldn't be a job of an editor if there were people, if there wasn't a need for that position. So to me, you have to find an editor who matches your style. And that like, you can't just outsource to any editor that you find on Facebook because they might not edit in the way that you do. There are people who are very amazing music video editors or montage wedding film editors that are perfect for, th if that's their style, that's not my style. So I have to find editors who understand my style and who work number one in the same software that I use in case I have to go in and make any changes. Like I can't, if they're using uh, Final Cut, I, I, I can't work with them very often because I don't use Final Cut. But um, finding the right editor to match your style, I don't think loses your integrity. Actually, I think what it might do is it might actually benefit your film from time to time because you're on set, for lack of a better word, for 10, 12 hours. And you know how hard you worked to get this specific shot. You know how hard it was to get the right angle for a speech. And if somebody's sitting there on the outside who doesn't know how hard you work to get that shot. Like if you work really hard, that shot's going to make the film, whether it benefits the film or hurts the film. If you put that kind of effort in that shot's going in the film, it's the same way with the narrative film. Right. So to me, having somebody from an outside perspective to help is amazing. I have a team, a, a, a group of friends. I say team, but it's not a team. Like I have a group of friends that I work with that all make their living as editors and cinematographer editors. And before I send a film to a client, I send that film to at least three of them. And I say, hey, can you watch this with fresh eyes? Because I've spent 30 hours on this edit. Like, can you watch this with fresh eyes and tell me if there's anything that I missed? If there's anything that's jarring, if there's anything that doesn't make sense, can you do that? And sometimes that gives me my best notes because like I was shoot, I just finished an edit and I sent it over to an editor and they're like, Hey man, your assistant cinematographer is creeping into the edge of one of these shots. <laughs> and it's like, I didn't even notice it because I was so focused on something else that shot that I didn't even notice the edge of the fridge or the edge of the frame. So yeah, I would say just find an editor that you like working with and that matches your style as a cinematographer and 
work with them. If you don't like to edit, then outsource it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Oh, you know, there's you know, nothing wrong, gonna there's nothing wrong right. with just being a cinematographer. No. Do what, do your strong points and let somebody else do something else. Just remember to a price, adjust your pricing accordingly. So you're not giving away some of your profit. That's exactly. Understand that you're going to pay somebody exactly. five, six, $700 to edit that film because it's a whole week's worth of work. And that's kind of perfect to go into question number three from Eric. He's from Illinois. How do you deal with budget couples? I really have fine tuned my filmmaking skills and I, maybe I price myself out, but couples on a tight budget love my work. I don't want to hurt feelings. How do I say no? <laughs> These people are serious, David. <laughs> so this is one of the funniest questions because I get yelled at all the time by people that are like biz, not business coaches, but people that I trust from a business perspective, because I, I don't say no very often. Um, so the way that I look at it is if you have the free time and let's just say somebody calls you up and they're like, Hey, we have, a, we have $1,200. That's what, that's what's in our budget. We love your work. We have $1,200. You've come highly recommended by everybody we've talked to. Is there anything that you can do? Sit back. Look, I, I just had this happen where I sat back. I didn't have any weddings until my first wedding of the year was the 27th of April. And I had a client come to me and say, we don't have a whole lot of money, but our wedding is on the 13th of April. We've worked. Our photographer highly recommends you. We would love to have you on our day. And I sat back and I said, I haven't shot a wedding in four months because it was April and I didn't shoot anything from January to March. I didn't have any weddings. And I said, I'm not working. I will use this wedding. I've already been to the, I'd been to the venue before. I'd worked with the photographer. The clients were super cool. I knew it wasn't going to be a, 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 a struggle to get the wedding film done. So I said, I'm going to take a new cinematographer with me as a second cinematographer. I'm going to guarantee a solo shoot because it was, it was a very small venue where I didn't need an assistant really. So I was like, I'm going to train a new cinematographer and I'm going to take this wedding and I'm going to trim out all the stuff that I don't like doing, which is editing speeches, editing first dances, the, the, the boring long form stuff. I still gave a ceremony because I, people want the ceremony, but I trimmed all of the stuff that I didn't want to do out of it. And I picked the film that I didn't have a lot of. So I said, okay, well, I don't have many of this package. So are you willing to do, for this money, can you take, can, how about a three to four minute film and the full ceremony? And I'll be there until I'm done. I'm not going to give you a set amount of hours. Like when we go through the timeline, I'll say, I'm going to start at this time and I'm going to end at this time. So I built essentially a custom package that benefited me from, I need this kind of a film to go online because I didn't have a whole lot of them sold. And I, because I couldn't share a whole lot of them. Nobody was going to take this film if they can't see one. So I, I take it on a case by case basis. If you don't want to work and if the money's not worth it to you, then don't take it. But if the money's worth it to you and you don't have anything else to do, use it as an educational experience that you get a little bit of money out of. Look at it from here's what I can do. Here's what I can experiment with. Here's what I can learn. And then you make a little bit of money off of it. Even if it's $300, $300 for a day's work is fine. You know, it's $300 more than you would have made if you didn't work. So like, don't take off. I mean, like I wouldn't do that on a Thursday if I wasn't, if I had to take off work and I had to lose, you know, a salary, I wouldn't be able to do that. But if you're already not working, like that's the way that I look at it is every single experience that I have is a learning experience, whether I make money off of it or whether I don't make money off of it. If I learn something, it's worth it to me. Well, and if we stay true to our passion and we are true storytellers and while yes, I know that everybody comes with a story and we can't always get tied up in their story. We want to help everybody, but right. there are times we can make the exceptions. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs will sit back and tell you the one time I went to do that job for so-and-so for less than my fee, let me just tell you who was in attendance at that job. And yep. now I have an account that is X, Y, Z, and I solely am their videographer. So yeah. And Sometimes. just and just, con and just contract. Make sure that you're make sure that you're very clear about what deliverables are. Make sure you're exactly. very clear about all these things because last thing you need is to take a wedding for under what you would normally charge 
a budget wedding for lack of a better term, and then have that budget wedding become a huge pain after the deliverables right. done. Right. Because they didn't understand what they were getting for the amount of money that they were spending. Right. And if we don't value well, ourselves, we can't expect our clients to value us or fellow wedding pros for the same facts. So that's a whole exactly. different topic. So question number four is uh, from Carla. Didn't say where she's from. Solo, Hi, sh solo shooter versus multi-shooter. When and why? Uh, solo shooter, never. <laughs> um, I So I actually... I don't like solo shooting a whole, whole lot. I always like to have at least one cinematographer there as a backup. Um, the times when I will solo shoot are very few and far between. And it has to be, I have to be able to walk from the, where the groom's getting ready to where the bride's getting ready. Like I can't, I, I can't have to physically leave a location to go and get that footage. So that's when I will solo shoot is if I'm able to, if it's like a very small venue where there's like a cabin 50 feet from the group from the bride's house that she's getting ready in that's when i will solo shoot um but i do my best to not even if i don't make as much money i'll bring a second shooter um like i did like i just in the story i just told where if i'm not if they're paying for a solo shooter that's when i'll i'll train that's when i'll bring somebody on as a shadow that's when i'll bring somebody on to learn stuff like that so I always recommend having an assistant with you because you're going to rock multiple cameras at, at at least two points in the day during the ceremony and during the speeches. You're going to rock multiple cameras and you can't monitor four cameras on your own. Can't monitor three cameras on your own. You can barely monitor two. So like, it's always good to have an, uh, somebody there at least for the ceremony and the reception to monitor your other cameras, make sure that it's still recording. If you're using a Sony, it cuts off after 30 minutes. So you're going to have to eventually go over there and hit record again. So like, what are you going to do? Set a, set an alarm on your phone and then potentially have it go off in the middle of the ceremony. No, like you, I always recommend having a second cinematographer and having a second cinematographer that you trust somebody that knows your style you like working with, cause you're going to spend a lot of time with them and that you can trust to go shoot something without you there and to produce the same quality footage that you would yourself produce. Gotcha. So here, here, this is going to be, a, I got a couple loaded ones here. So we'll try, oh. we'll try to get through a couple of these. Um, Haley, is, Haley is from Georgia. And I, I actually do think I know who Haley is. And I, and I kind of think I know the six circumstance she's talking to, but she wants to ask you, why can't I have my first dance song on my film? Copyright 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 that's your main re reason um so there we all use copyright like we don't we don't use copyright in music in our films if you are you're running the risk of getting sued and getting sued badly um so we use websites like song freedom or firefly music bed um stuff like that to license our music and we pay to license that music that's part of the investment that you pay to your filmmaker that money gets paid back out to a website like song freedom or like the music bed to license the music that's used in your film. So it's a different copyright to actually play that music at your wedding reception, but your DJ actually owns the rights to do that. So like there are songs, even the DJs can't play from time to time. Now it's few and far between, but certain DJs can't play certain songs video. It's very, it's, it's similar, but it's different. We use specific websites that we can license those tracks to use online and in marketing stuff. So short answer, copyright, long answer, DM me because I can explain this. <laughs> for, I could spend hours explaining this. Oh, yes, indeed. All right, Jeff does not say where from. Jeff wants to really know how and why um, can you break into other areas of filmmaking in an easy transition. So Jeff, I, I tried to send you an email to ask you and you didn't get back to me. So I, I'm just going to say, David, may, I think maybe he wants to know is, can you, how can you do both things? Can I maybe give him a tip on how that you, how to maybe go about seeing some people to do some editorial work or some other events maybe. So utilize. So for me, the easiest way for me was I worked with people who were already in that industry. So when I would second shoot, when I would lead shoot, when I would work with these kinds of people, they would see the passion that I brought to weddings and would want to know if I could do that on a corporate side. And I understand that like where my strength lies is in run and gun 
cinematography, meaning shooting 180 clips for a four minute video, as opposed to a 30 second commercial spot where you have eight shots that get shot over 10 hours. You know, like I understood that running gun cinematography, uh, interviews, B roll, stuff like that was where my, was where my skill set lied. So people started kind of referring me for those kinds of projects, but that eventually the work that I produced there was pretty enough that people were like, well, what can you do if we give you time? And it's like, well, let's, let's see kind of how it goes. So really just utilizing your connections and utilizing, it's just like we said earlier, like when you do work for people, like utilize it as a learning experience. And when you work with other people, don't discount what they say. Understand that every person could be a potential, a, a potential um, resource for, you know, for future work. And, so and just, just and don't forget to tell people the wedding industry, other pros. Hey, by the way, if you need some branding, I can do that. Or talk about that you do something else if that's something at, that you want to do. At dinner, not exactly. during photo, not at, dinner. During, at not during photo time. But yeah, yeah, just talk. Be personable. Like it's it's you don't have to be just because we're artists and just because we work behind a camera doesn't mean we gotta be we all have to be um Tim Burton. We don't have to be weird. Like we can just be normal people who enjoy talking to other creatives. So like, just open up, explain what you do and talk to people and get contact information and stay in contact with those people. Become Facebook friends, share your work and people will see it. Exactly. Share what you want to do. That's how it is. All right. Scott wants to know, Scott, I don't know where you're from, Scott. Scott wants to know, what's your take on black and white films solo and what's your take on black and white films integrating black and white with your uh, color coverage? Uh, I, I would not do a black and white film only. I like the, the client would have to specifically request that. Um, I think that would be actually kind of cool. It would be very different. Um, right. I would pr- like, I'd probably shoot it in black and white. Honestly, if they specifically requested that there are options to do that, um, in your camera to just like completely desaturate your image and then just grade it later. But, um, I don't think I would, it would have to be very specifically, um, very specifically requested by the client for black and whites, like being black and white shots being put into the film. That's color. I'm cool with it. I've seen some cool ways to do it. I I wouldn't want it just in the middle of things. Um, Like I wouldn't want to go like a color shot into a black and white shot into a color shot into a black and white shot. Like it would have to be a specific sequence that's black and white for a reason. But I think do you man, like have at it. Like, I think that would be super cool. If you have a way to do it, do it. If you can make it look cool. I know a ton of wedding videographers that have developed LUTs specifically for black and white. So just, you know, it's, I think it's becoming more of a thing. I actually did it in a film just a little bit ago um, for a friend that I contracted and I thought it was super cool. I used it as like my ending sequence because it was nighttime and I, there was no point in really being color. So yeah, I think I think if you can make it look cool, do it. Like there's no there's no right or wrong answer as to how to be creative. Exactly. Everyone's creative it's, in their own way. Exactly. So client. And if you and if that's something you want to offer, man, set yourself talk about setting yourself apart from the crowd. Say, hey, by the way, I have a whole package, it's just black and white and monotone coverage. Knock yourself out. You know? Hey listeners, if somebody wants me to do a black and white film, I'll throw you a <laughs> discount because I think it's, that would be super cool. Exactly. And so we have Heather. Uh she is from Georgia and she says is it ever possible to get the outtakes and is this something that you can use as add-on coverage? I'm thinking Heather may be a, a person in the industry. Uh, so I, like, I don't have a lot of outtakes real, real often because I shoot for a very specific idea. Um, so I don't have a whole, whole lot of outtakes. The only outtake I could remember is I got tripped once while doing a kiss and cheer shot. I wasn't paying attention to behind me and I slammed right into a footstool and just ate it just went down hard and we actually did send that to the client and it was pretty funny but um no i like i don't offer outtakes so there was this story i read a while ago i'm not going to mention the company but somebody got sued it was like a class action lawsuit because an outtake went live um it went online where the groom passed out on the dance floor in the middle of the garter like just and was down (laughs) And the cinematographer posted it online and obviously it was incredibly embarrassing to the client. So like 
I like I for for me outtakes aren't really my style. Um, if they are, if like funny films or something that you do, if that's your style, then yeah, totally go for it. But it w- I wouldn't do it. So that's just my personal opinion, though. I'm more of a serious mood drama kind of a person, like to 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 bring the dramatic elements to the film, and every once in a while toss in a joke from a best man. But like, I know there are people who do that. So like again, just like the answer for the last question, like there's no right or wrong for creativity. So if you want to do it, totally do it. And again, if that's what you want to sell your clients, if you show that people will come to you for that niche and people will hire you. All right. Exactly. There's a, from Todd, who was also from Georgia shooting during dinner. Do you shoot mealtime dinner times? um, If you do how much, and then do you, is it mandatory that meals are included in your contract? I'm thinking Todd is a, also an industry person. Todd, Todd, yeah, Todd sounds like somebody from the industry. Um, for, no, I don't shoot dinner. Nobody really looks attractive eating and nobody wants footage of themselves eating. Um, I have seen films where dinner footage has um, been a huge part of it. Um, and I think maybe we could even link it because it's a, it's a couple out in Colorado that, that made the wedding film. Um, but it was like a very specific reason that they did it was because it was like a wedding festival kind of a thing out in the woods where they grilled all their own food. They had huge like salt racks and like all sorts of stuff to like actually like um, cook all the meat that they cook. So they, they got shots of that kind of stuff um, and people actually eating there. But that was because the food was something very specific to the party atmosphere and the vibe of the wedding itself. Right. Like, it's I'm almost not like it was a starring role in the wedding. It was the food. It, it, that, yeah. Exactly. Like I'm not going to go. If I, got, if I went and shot a famous chef's wedding, I probably would shoot some of the food. But like for the average person who's getting married at like a golf course, like they don't really care about the food that's in the buffet line. So I'm not really going to shoot a whole lot of details on that. I'll focus on the stuff that they specifically brought in. Right. And as as photographers on that note, don't forget to shoot some of those. But when you're going to go shoot some of that food, because again, this opens the door for your building a relationship with the caterer, shoot it creatively. Do not just go up to the, in St. Louis, I can talk about the Muscacelli, which we don't have down here. Don't just go up and grab just a, you know, do something creative folks and then present that to the caterer and and they will love that. All right. Question number 10. Oh, also second, second, second part of his question though, real quick. Oh, I feel kind of bad. Yes. Yeah. Abs- yeah. Absolutely. Food is part of the contract. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's in all my contracts. It's even in there to cover the photographer in case I work with a photographer who doesn't know, like it's in my contract that the, that the client has to provide a hot meal for the photographers and the videographers. I was just going to say, is it the same meal that the people are, 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 are the guests yeah. reading or is it just yeah. a hot meal? It's, I, I just have it specified as a hot meal. Typically a hot meal is the food that the guests are eating. But at the same time, like, I'm not going to, if I don't get fed, then I don't get fed. I'm not going to go and, like, be a jerk about it. Do you have in your contract that if you don't get fed, you get to leave for an hour to have lunch and come back? Yeah, I'm not doing it. Yeah. What the heck is that? Right. What, why would you do that? That just makes your work, it's your work, guys. Like, it's, be proud, like, put the work into your own, like, it's your name on the thing. It's not, so... Well, I'm too too paranoid. I would get in my car and go to McDonald's and have a flat tire or a car wreck and couldn't get back. I just, I'm too paranoid. Just bring bring snacks, man. I got a cooler in my car with a bunch of Red Bulls and a bunch of water and a bunch of peanut butter bars. You know, and I have found in my years, the clients ask, I mean, I just have that for Saturday's wedding. The, the, the client's mom is like, Hey, I want to number how many meals you need. Clients ask, people aren't going to treat you like jerks. If this is how you present them. And you know, like with me booking two years out, you get to know these people. They know, they, people know that they read my blogs. They read about me. They bring me pop tarts on the morning because they know that I eat that or sometimes I don't, but they'll bring I get, me. I get Red Bull. Exactly. People, people read about us and they know about us and, it, and it's fun like that. But it's like, I do believe we need to eat, but it's a long day, but I'm, I'm not going to get in a pissy fight without and, eating. Yeah. I'm just I'm not. so I'm so unhealthy when it comes to my eating as well. Like I still eat like a seven year old who got let loose at a grocery store. So like if I get, if I don't get food, like I'll grab something, I'll grab a gas station hot dog on my way into the morning and that'll hold me over for a majority of the day. And then I'll reach a point where I'm like, if I'm starting to get hungry at seven o'clock at night and I'm not getting fed in my head, I'm just like, well, I'm just going to order emos when I get home. Like it's not a problem. 
Well, well I think we get so engulfed in what we're doing that we don't even realize we're not eating. And exactly. like, I know exactly. down here for us, it gets so hot that, you know, people come up to me by the time we get to the reception, they go, Bobby, here's three bottles of water. And I have to go, look, I know I look like I'm dying, but I'm really okay. I'm just <laughs> right. fat and red and dying of heat. And I wear all black. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really okay. Put a, put, a, put a hot meal in your contract and be thankful when you get one. That's exactly. pretty much it. Exactly. All right. Question number 10 is how do you handle missing a moment or maybe not getting something on the video that the client wanted. How do you deal with managing client expectations? And that is from Sue. Doesn't say where from. So I have a pre-planning meeting about six weeks, six to four weeks out from the event. And I specifically ask, is there anything out of the ordinary that I need to be paying attention to that I wouldn't get? naturally so like that eliminates like well we definitely want a shot of you know jim's reaction as i walk down the aisle and it's like well yeah like we want shots of me getting in the dress like yeah okay those things are definitely going to get there but like is there a sh like are you going to have a photo of grandma on your bouquet are there any of these things that are special and i write that down and i have planning software where anybody who shoots with me has access to it and they are required to look at that paperwork and see if there's anything specific. Um, if I miss something, I just make the film as best as I possibly can. And then if they ask about it, they're like, Hey, is there any chance that this can happen? Like, is there any chance that we can get this in the film? It's like, unfortunately due to circumstances of the day, we were, we missed that. I'm really sorry. I hope it's not a huge deal. You know, like, I, I like I don't know the way to I don't know the best way to put this because like you don't want to as a creative person and as somebody who's trying to do the best job that you can you don't want to put bad expectations in their head in the very beginning. So like if I miss something I don't want to tell the bride right after I miss it. So like but at the, like at the same time like you don't want to like lie and say like and pretend like you got something that you didn't get. So it's like it's managing client expectations in that way where you just, you do the best job that you could possibly do. And most people are going to understand that errors happen. Now, if you don't get the bride getting in her dress, you got a little bit of a problem. But if you miss something here and there, like, oh, we really wanted to get a shot of, you know, us under the veil. More than likely, they're not going to care too terribly much about that if you miss that. Because you're probably not missing it because you're messing around on your phone. You probably missed it because you're inside shooting something else. Or they didn't wear a veil and forgot that they asked that question. <laughs> right, right. Right. A majority of the time, if you miss something minor, nobody's really going to cause a stink over it as long as you do a good job with everything else. You know, and if you miss something major, then you you have to figure it out. I mean, you have to, like, that's the main thing about wedding videography is it's problem solving. You know, you have to solve a problem as quick as you possibly can, as best as you possibly can. And understand that like, you're still, yes, you're the artist, but you're still producing a product for a client. So just put the effort in, know what you have to get, remember what you have to get. And then do your best to get it. And if you don't have a reason for why you did. There so. you go. Good. All right, folks, that is your 10 top questions for the wonderful David Skagg. So, you know, again, guys, go ahead and uh, throughout you know, Instagram, if you got some other questions, reach out to David, you guys know how to reach him. We'll put that links back in this bonus episode as well. But uh, thank you listeners for coming in. I think those were 10 really good questions for a videographer, cinematographer. So thanks everybody. Everybody have a fab -a week and thanks so much, David. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Thanks for joining us. We hope these conversations will take you into your wedding weekend with a little more confidence, proud of what you do, and how you serve your clients. Maybe you even picked up a business tip or two. Till next time, be fabulous.